right, we're in week two of diving into Genesis chapter 15. And we said last week, chapter 12 is really important to see the initial call and promise of God on Abraham and his people. Uh, Chapter 15 is where God actually establishes the covenant. And today is uh, where we get the phrase to to cut a deal uh, comes up right here. Genesis 15, 7 through 21. He said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. But Abram said, Lord God, how do I know that I will actually possess it? He said, Bring me a three-year-old female calf, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a dove, and a young pigeon. He took all these animals, split them in half, and laid the halves facing each other. But he didn't split the birds. When vultures swooped down on the carcasses, Abram waved them off. After the sun set, Abram slept deeply. A terrifying and deep darkness settled over him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Have no doubt that your descendants will live as immigrants in a land that isn't their own, where they will be oppressed slaves for 400 years. But after I punish the nations they serve, they will leave it with great wealth. As for you, you will join your ancestors in peace and be buried after a long, good life. The fourth generation will return here since the Amorites' wrongdoing won't have reached its peak until then. After the sun had set and darkness had deepened, a smoking vessel with a fiery flame passed between the split open animals. That day the Lord cut a covenant with Abram. To your descendants I give this land. Okay, so chapter 15 is a really foundational chapter for understanding the covenant God is making with Israel from here on out. And we've already kind of talked about this, but Abraham uh, in his own story, and here especially, really foreshadows so much of what Israel is going to go through. He's already gone down to Egypt and come back out, and here Uh, God actually gives him a vision of what's going to happen to all of his descendants. Uh, So it's a little dark, it's terrifying. Your descendants are going to go and become slaves, but I will rescue them uh, in the fourth generation. Okay, Uh, I want to talk most with this passage about this image of covenant. And uh, I like this phrase here, cut a covenant. Actually, the verb uh, to create a covenant, to make a covenant, in, in Hebrew is this word cut, right? And so in the same way that these animals were cut in half, uh, the Lord cut a covenant. We still use that in English today, maybe with the uh, uh, phrase, you know, cut a deal. Uh, but when God makes a promise to, uh, to a people, he's cutting a covenant. And this is the image that we get here. This idea, it's really weird for us. What's going on here? What, what's, what's so important about splitting these animals in half and uh, basically he would have split the animals in half and made a row right here and this was a well-known way of creating a covenant between usually a powerful king and a a vassal servant in that day and so they would uh, or any kind of important deal that you might be making with with either equal parties of equal power or uh, a, a strong power and a servant you would put the animals like this and it would create this pathway with the blood of these sacrificed animals in between what would happen is you would lay out the stipulations of the covenant whatever the promise is if the king is promising to provide for his servants and the servant is promising to obey the king and all of that and then what normally would happen and this is uh Knowing this kind of history, you kind of start to see what, uh, what's happening here in a different light. Because what would normally happen is both parties would then walk through the cut animals. It's this visual representation. When you cut a covenant with someone, what you're doing is you're saying, I am promising to uphold my end of the bargain. I am promising to, o- to uphold my side of the covenant. Or may I become like these animals here cut and laid out on the ground. So it's a really visceral, very uh, intense image to say, I promise to follow my side of the covenant or else I will die like these animals. Uh, And uh, and here, if you dig into the ancient covenants uh, in this world, uh, there were a few scenarios. Sometimes both parties would walk through Or if it was between a high king and a servant, only the servant would walk through because the king was already going to be seen as honorable. And uh, of course, he would never have to sully himself to walk through. Only the servant has to promise to obey the king. The king doesn't have to promise the same way. The mind-blowing, incredible thing that God does here 
is that when you when you look at the point where Abraham should have walked through the covenant, Abraham doesn't step one foot through this path, if you see that. Um, when God said, here, I'm going to make a promise with you, Abraham would have fully expected, okay, I'm going to, oh, I, I know what this is like. Abraham doesn't have to be told. He just knows, oh, I know what God wants me to do. He splits the animals. He sets them out. And then Abraham's waiting here on the side. But at the moment when Abraham should have walked through, God walks through. A smoking vessel and a fiery flame go through. I think I've, I've often seen this and heard this described as there's uh, in, in two forms, God walks through the covenant. What is God doing here? He's showing to Abraham that, of course, God is going to uphold his side of the deal. He's going to uphold his side of the covenant. But God also walks through for Abraham's sake. Um, in, in all the ways that Abraham and all of God's people are going to break this covenant, they never actually walked through um, because if they did, there would be no hope. God says, you know what? That there's this packed into this image is all of the grace that points us straight to Jesus because God walks through the covenant on Abraham's behalf. Uh, Abraham was, the verse before this, Abraham believed the Lord and he was counted as a faithful member of the covenant, not by works. And then here, God doubles down on that and says, you know what, Abraham, when you fail, I'm the one that's going to be destroyed. God walks through the covenant, pointing us all the way, honestly, to Jesus. To say, in all the ways that God's people are going to break this covenant, Jesus is going to take that on himself. He is the one that's going to be destroyed for our sake. He is going to die in the, in the place of Abraham and all of his descendants so that we could live. Because if Abraham had walked through, we would have, we would have no choice. But God walked through on our behalf. One thing I love about this passage is the way that it highlights uh, the reality that God has been a God of grace the entire time. This uh, God established his relationship with his people by sheer grace. Some of us uh, sometimes wrongly attribute the Old Testament to be a religion of works and then it changed in the New Testament. But we see today God, God is the one that walked through uh, the sacrifice. Uh, from the beginning, he said, Abraham, you can't, you can't earn this. And even if you tried, it wouldn't work. It would fail miserably. And yet uh, today we see just in, this incredible picture of grace. Maybe it's a little antiquated or outdated in our mind. We, we, we don't have that kind of image running around our mind. But what, what the ancient world would have seen when they read chapter 15 was a God of complete grace. Maybe take some time this week to reflect on that, to, to praise God for the way that he has always been interacting with us through grace, pointing forward to the day where he would take the punishment on our behalf. Uh, maybe the, the response this week is to just be in awe and wonder, to, to worship God, to thank him for his sacrifice for us. <laughs>